trees coming back to life. Uh, our lives are seem to come back to normal after 2020. And see, everything's getting crowded. I don't get mad and when the traffic's really bad anymore because I remember a year ago today when I was out there by myself and it was really eerie. And now to have all this, it's just all great. And it's just like, like just an excited kid. Let's just celebrate how awesome our God is to us. He's so much better to us than we deserve. And even when things go bad and for us and in, in our world, we're always okay because nothing can take what he has given us away from us. And we're going to celebrate that this morning. So let's... There's a place There's a place where I love to run and play There's a place where I sing new songs of praise Dancing with my Father and God in fields of praise Dancing with my Father and God in fields of praise There's a place there's a place where I lose myself in Him. There's a place where I find myself again. I'm dancing with my Father and God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father and God in fields of grace. Dancing. Father in God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father in God in fields of praise. There's a place where religion finally dies. There's a place where I lose my selfish pride. My Father in God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father in God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father in God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father in God in fields of praise. I love my Father. Selfish pride. Dancing with my father and God in fields of praise. Dancing with my father and God in fields of praise. Dancing with my father and God in fields of praise. Dancing with my father and God in fields of praise. I need you to open 
open my eyes see that you're shaping my life all I am
so close to me that I can hardly move or breathe. I can feel your presence all around. I fall knees down to the ground.
Be seated. when you really think about it, at the end of the day, he's the only one that really matters. Not how you think, not how you feel. He's the only one that really matters. And, um, you know, I think today is a good, appropriate teaching. I think um, I put this up before service to get some of you to read that. Um, let, me add, let me just ask you before. And, you know, you can be honest. Have you ever heard of the unjust servant? Anybody ever heard of the unjust servant in Scripture? Have you ever wondered what the heck it means? Because the Lord, the Lord commends the unjust servant. He commends him. He says he's better than the righteous, the sons of light. I'm like, wait, 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 what? Now, I'm going to read it. As soon as I find it, I'm going to read it. But, but here, here's, here's, I just got back from Mexico, and um, that was a great trip. It's, very, it's always very, very humbling to cross the border. Just the pressure of going across, just the pressure of wondering if you're going to get searched, just, you know, what the process is going to be, because you never know who you're going to run into over there. And, you know, the government is corrupt, the police are corrupt on the most part, the cartel's there, and you know, it's just, it's a crazy city, but the Lord has always protected us and he's got us through and, and brothers for others had given me some boxes of things to take into Mexico and um, so I was taking a few extra boxes. I took a lot of candy. We took, we, 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 we packaged a lot of boxes of um, kids supplies, uh, things to put in a little bag, little trinkets that you go to the dollar store and get a hundred little, you know, try to catch a little ball and thing right there, you know, those kind of things for the kids. And they, let me tell you something. In Mexico, those things will last forever. They like them. <laughs> they, they'll play with them. So we filled their bags up with all kind of little things like that. Because I'm going to get some pictures and be posting them on my Facebook uh, as we finish and get all of them. Because, you know, a lot of those houses where we go are built out of plywood or, or um, pallets. They, they use pallets a lot for the fences and, you know, for some of the structure. And so, you know, they're very humble people. They're, they're, they're. They're really good people. Um, they're just very oppressed where they're at. And so we bring, you know, a cup of cold water to them. That's what we do. You know, the Lord says, you know, if you can just give a cup of cold water, make their misery a little less miserable, that's what we do. That's our calling. That's part of our journey. And, and we have a certain responsibility to that, honestly. <laughs> so today's story, today's teaching is, let me just give you a background because our way of thinking about commerce is different than the way commerce was done back in Jesus' day. They didn't necessarily all deal with money. They dealt with produce. You, you grow tomatoes, you grow the potatoes, I'll switch you some of my tomatoes for your potatoes, and that's how business was done, and you paid your bills with potatoes. And so there's no currency, and so certain landowners sometimes own big plots of land, and, and you know... God, when you read the book of Deuteronomy and you read the book of Leviticus, God put in there that every tribe had its own land. Every tribe, they, they were responsible. Some people got to live by the coast. Some people had to live over by the mountains where it was dry, you know. And, and these guys couldn't get mad at them guys because it was God that put them there. But in the midst of all that, doing life and things like that, people would make bad decisions. Who ain't never made a bad. And when you make certain bad decisions, it costs you. Um, and when it cost you in those days, usually it cost you your land. Now, you only lost that land for seven years, then you get it back. But still, for seven years, you lost that land. Somebody else could take your land and grow their crops on it. And so a landowner that was acquiring other people's crops couldn't man manage it all himself, so he would hire people to run it for him. And that was a steward. That was, that's, that's that position's name, a steward. And that steward, as a matter of fact, let me just show you. Stewardship, the job of supervising or taking care of something such as an organization or property. So a steward. Matter of fact, the regular definition says governor, uses the word governor. You know, one who rules a house. Superior servant. Listen to that. Superior servant. Still a servant, 
but in a different position. A steward's in a different position. And so let's read Luke chapter 16 because that's kind of what's taking place here. There's a, there's a landowner and then there's a steward over the land and then that landowner's written out property on that for other people to grow their produce on it. He gets a cut, they get their part. And so it's the steward's job to go around and collect the, the payments from the, from the guys. And so the, 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 the rich man will go, hey, I'm going to go on a five-year vacation. I'm going to leave the steward. You're going to be in control of gathering all my profit from everybody. Well, man, for five years, everything that's the landowner's is also now the superior servant. He gets to sleep in the man's bed if he wants to because he ain't there to tell him no. And so we kind of, this is who this guy is. This guy is the manager. He's the manager of the owner's stuff. He doesn't own it, but he gets to control it like he owns it. Listen to me. He gets to control it like he owns it. So let's look at Luke chapter 16. All right, let me get to Luke chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Oh, then why I'm on the other side of Acts. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. You remember, I, got, I do two studies, and so I'm in different parts of the book all the time, Sundays and Wednesdays, so I'm having to go back and forth from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he also said to his disciples, so last week we talked about the parable of the, the prodigal son who wasted his dad's inheritance. That conversation is continuing on in the midst of Pharisees because that's who he started talking to, so Pharisees. But while, he's, while, the, while he knows the Pharisees are there, he's talking to his disciples knowing the Pharisees are listening to him tell his disciples. It's like they're listening to his conversation to the disciples and he's going to rebuke them in this conversation. And then they're going to get upset. And then they're going to get into this other conversation. Hold on. So there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him. Notice somebody told on him. That this man was wasting his goods. The same word as the prodigal son wasting his father's stuff. Doing it, just wasting it. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be a steward. I'm calling you to the carpet. I need to know what's owed to me from everybody. And then you're gone. <laughs> Sorry about the sniffling, folks. Oh. The allergies. Who appreciates Texas allergies? Just let me know. <laughs> mm. Okay. Then the steward said within himself, this is where it gets interesting and interestingly cool. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do for my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I cannot dig and I am ashamed to beg. What he's saying is I'm too good to dig and I'm too good to beg. Because I'm a steward. I'm a superior servant. Think about that. I'm a superior servant. I have resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he's thinking ahead. That's very, 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 very important to this story. That's almost the, that's almost the key to this story is the fact that this guy just got fired and immediately he's thinking, what do I do? What moves do I make? This is what happened. And so he's thinking, I got to survive for another how many years in front of me? What am I going to do? Well, he's, a, he's, a, he's already an unjust servant. So he's not thinking necessarily Christianese. He's thinking manese. Human the way the humans think. I have resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors, not his debtors, his master's debtors to him and said first, said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and say it's 50. Ooh, that dude just got 50 bucks or 50 things back to himself. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And so he went to all of them and made deals with all of them. 
So the master commended the unjust servant because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. (laughs) And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. What? Why is the Lord telling us to make friends with unrighteous mammon? Let me tell you what unrighteous mammon is. Unrighteous mammon would be my stimulus check that I got. Because that came from some unrighteous people. (laughs) Came in an unrighteous way. From an unrighteous system. Now I spent that sucker. Don't get me wrong. Matter of fact, I'm getting a new driveway this week. Because of this unrighteous mammon. Let me tell you something. He didn't say, look, mammon is just power, wealth, money, spending, the the ability to have value, wealth, to to, to get things and do things. He knows we need money. And he's not saying that he's opposed to getting money or that we're not supposed to spend the money that we earn and work for. But what happens is when it becomes all that's in front of us, that's... And it's not even that it's all what's in front of us. It's measured to Christ, you know. So you're pursuing one or the other. And today, we're going to see that it matters that you understand which you're pursuing. Because it's very important in our journey as Christians. Because there's the end to our journey. Listen to what I'm saying. There's a point that I cannot help you. And that's when you die. That's when you go before the Lord. And, 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 and it's going to get better than what I just said. But, so, uh, and I say to you, verse 9, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. That's very difficult, but just pay attention to everlasting. That's important. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is just in what is least is unjust also, or he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, listen to what he's saying. If you have not been faithful with the money of this world, that's what he's saying. If you have been unfaithful with the money of this world, let's read that again. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? If you can't be faithful to manage a store, why would God give you the ownership of a store? If you can't be faithful to a girlfriend, why would God give you a wife? <laughs> you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot to this. And that's just little cherries I picked off the tree, but that's not really what I'm talking about. Listen, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I'm only going to read verse 14 then we'll pick this up next week. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. They did not like what he was saying because it, it offended them. It offended them. So a couple of things. Uh, this is uh, what this guy says about unrighteous mammon that kind of described it, this Clark, this commentator. Jesus called it unrighteous mammon because riches promise much and perform nothing. They excite hope, they excite hope and confidence and deceive both. In making a man depend on them for happiness, they rob him of the salvation of God and eternal glory. So first thing that God's saying is is the the Pharisees 
were the special servants. The people of Israel were the land and the servants that were in the land. And the Pharisees were taking more from the people than what God had allowed them to take from the people. <laughs> the word trespass means going, you know, it's, it's, it means you're, you're going into a property you're not supposed to be over in. And, and, and God says to us, you know, our trespasses and sins. You know, he tells us, all of us are guilty of trespass and sin, right? He's, we're all guilty of that. But then this righteousness, this true righteousness now, because this world is, un, un, is unrighteous. Everything about this world is unrighteous, but what God gives us is righteous, righteousness. And so what he's saying is, if I can't trust you to be a human with human things, why would I trust you with supernatural and spiritual things? If, if God were to do it, because let me tell you something, there's a, that, you know, this is a, and if you're in accounting, and you love numbers, that is weird. <laughs> weird. I get it. Hey, I did a tile, you know, I was a tile man for 30 years, or almost 20, almost, yeah, about 30 years. And uh, so I worked in lots of people, people's houses, and um, one of the, our members, Don Bush, that, that comes to our church, he was a contractor, I worked for him, and he called me to do a tile job for a guy who was a phys physicist professor at Baylor, and he was, his, and he was, he came from another country, and his thing was the string theory, the string theory. Now, if you don't know what the string theory is, they don't know what the string theory is. They, they have, it's because theory, they have an idea, but, it's, but I walked into his house and he had a, one wall painted black, pure black. And man, it looked like Albert Einstein's office in there. Just the formula. It was just incredible in there. Just to think about all the different kind of studies and people. and I don't even know what I was talking about. I got tripped up when I started thinking about the string theory. I was over here thinking about the string theory again. Because that's a real, that's a great, that's an interesting subject. But. I don't even know what I'm saying. Oh. Philippians 4. Here's what, we, here's what we have to understand is we are stewards of something that God gave us. The first thing you're a steward of is your life. Think about that. The one thing about the unjust servant, think about this. The, the thing about the one unjust servant, he was thinking about his future. That's what the Lord commended him for. Because he wasn't just thinking about how he was going to get through today. He was quickly thinking about his future. And that's what the Lord commended him on. He said, you as Christians, you as sons of light, you're not thinking about your future. You're not thinking about where real treasure's at. You're not thinking about your real home to prepare for it. Because what we do here is, what does he say? Don't store up or build up or chase after treasures that the thief and rust can take from you. Store up treasure in heaven. Why aren't you being shrewd with the unrighteous mammon to produce righteousness? Why can't you use unrighteous mammon for righteousness? You do. You do use it. You give it and we go to Mexico. We go to the streets. We serve. We got food. We do, you do do those things. But every single one of us has a part and a responsibility in the kingdom. Not just me and not just those that are retired that have a good income. Not those that have just been more blessed and have more and have given more than, they, than, than others have. And we've had people donate $10,000 here for that or $4,000 here for this or $20,000 for that. I mean, that's incredible for me because in the end, I'm the steward of all that. Right, Annette? At the end of the day, it's the pastor. It's the pastor. It's me. And I take full responsibility. You know what? I walk around here going, Lord, I am so humbled that you would trust me with the responsibility to distribute. To make sure I'm not gleaning where I'm not supposed to be gleaning. 
and just constantly distribute, just doing my part as a steward. Because at the end of the day, all I'm caring about is storing up in heaven. Now, I will say this, that I do sit at home sometimes and I just go, Lord, how blessed am I? Because if everything collapsed, I guarantee you, the church would come together to help me. Just like the son just stood was doing negative things to get that, I get it from doing the positive things and even in a greater way. I didn't have to connive you to get it. I just had to love you the way God asked me to love you and do what I can do for you and serve you the way I can serve you. And, and in response, we got a relationship now. And now you care about me, I care about you. Something happens to me, you got my back. I feel that, I know that. I, 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 I just go, Lord, I'm good now. Woo, I got my retirement, good now. And every one of you can get that in one way or another. In the right way. Because if all you're thinking about is the financial ability to secure a future, you know what happened to 100% of the miracles that Jesus performed on people? They all died. They all died. You die in this world. You die here. And the, and the, and the troubling part is we don't know when. I told my wife last night, I go, you know what I asked from the Lord? This is all I asked from the Lord. Not that he'd give me a full life, not that even, I mean, yes, I would appreciate him to give my kids a full life and let them live to be 150 years. I mean, nobody wants to live to be 150, but that'd be a curse on my kids. But anyways, <laughs> you know, I would want that. But here's, here's, here's what I told my wife. All I asked from the Lord is to give me time with the one that's going to pass away, that I know that they're going to pass away, that they don't just, because it's hard and it's very difficult. And I just said, Lord, you know, but you do it your way. I'm going to serve you and follow you and be a good steward of what I got, and that's my life. A drug addict, he thinks about his life. He thinks about his future. Let me tell you what, you think a drug addict don't think about his future? Man, I got, what am I going to do for the next hour? I got to give me a, I got to go get something. And they're already thinking the next hour. What they got to do the next hour. Now, that's a drug addict. He thinks the next hour. Right, bro? He thinks the next hour. Some people think about just one week at a time. I'm just going to check the check. I'm just going to get one week at a time. And you just, you live that. That's your future. Because you, you can't figure out how to get out of something like that. I lived like that for years. Just check the check, check the check, check. But then there's some people. Got a, got a year's supply. Because in those days, you wanted to, the, the more potatoes you had stored up, well, you can't store potatoes very long. But I'm sure they had, they had ways of storing potatoes. They're smarter than we are. But they would take, they would, they would take their produce, and they go, look, we have enough for a year. We're good for a year. So you know what? They were rich. Because God made sure their garden was full and they had enough for a year and so they did the right thing. They weren't just trying to get through the day because people would wake up to figure out how to just get through the day. That's not much of a future. God wants to give, God says, now that's this world's way of thinking. What we have to start thinking about is our eternal future. Our eternal future. Because there's an accounting coming. No, no, no. There's an audit. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. There's an audit coming. Now, for Christians, you're not going to be executed on that day of the audit. That's a different judgment for us. Just know that. You're not condemned for that. Now, I will tell you this, though. But if you're not covered in the blood, that audit's going to be a different kind of audit. But there's an audit for Christians Nevertheless, and, and, and this, is, this is what Paul has explained about using unrighteous mammon. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek to give, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. 
the Lord is saying, what Paul is saying is, I'm putting you in a position to store up in your account. Hey, here's a need. We're going to Mexico. Here's a need. Store up in your account. Hey, we're going to the streets. Here, give a little bit. For, store up for your account. Use your unrighteous mammon. Now, I'm not asking for your money. This is not an offering service. If I was Pentecostal, it dang sure would be. I'm just telling you, if I was, if I was a Pentecostal, we took four through the study. Because some of you needed a second go round to get moved sometimes. <laughs> and some of you need a third go round. I mean, that's what the Pentecostals think. They just need to see that thing come by. One more time, and they'll be convicted, thinking, man, it's coming again. Luke 12. Now he's talking to the Christians, right? Let, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Be ready. That means you're up, you got your belt on, and you're ready to move. You're ready for action. And have your lamp burning in case it's at night. What happened? There we go. And you yourselves will be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks. Now, he's talking to the Jewish people also. Because he's talking about the wedding feast of the church, I believe. And he will turn from the wedding that he comes and knocks that they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and then sit them down to eat and will come and serve them. He wants us watching for him every day. You know, and, and watching for him doesn't mean going outside, sitting in a lawn chair, looking up, watching for him, or looking at the east and watching for him. What it means is in your daily life, in the course of your life, in the course of living, in the course of doing life, in the course of getting gas, in the course of whatever, when people get on your nerves, when, when, when you're moved to get into a negative whatever, just remember he's coming and be ready. You don't want him to come when you're like that. You don't want to, you don't want to be in the midst of sin. You don't want to be in the midst of ugliness. You don't want to be in the midst of, you don't want to be where you don't, where, when he comes back in a place you don't want to be found. You want to be found in the right state of mind. You want to be found with the right heart. You want, to be fi- you want to be found with the right direction. You want to be found on the right path. You want to be found doing what you were called to do in this life. Because at the end of the day, you were not called to be a plumber. You were not called to be a plumber. Let me tell you something. You were called to be a man of God and he gave you plumbing so that you could be the man of God you are. That's how he does it. Because we learn in our business, don't we? I, when, I was in tile, when I was in the tile business, the Lord was always speaking. I remember, I would tile a room this big. I would tile rooms this big. And you got to make sure that sucker's straight. Because if you get a little bit off over there, when you get over here, you can't fix that. Because you're so far, you, the only way to fix that is to chisel it out. I'm like, I've done that before. I go, man, I didn't pay attention just a little, I mean, just a little bit off over there. And messed the whole job up over here. I got over here and I go, hey, what happened? How come I'm, oh, man, my line's like that. My, my grout joints are messed up. Let's start over. And the Lord says, do it right the first time. Pay attention, do all the measurements, do prayer, do the, you know, think it through, do all the work, do everything you're supposed to do, and then do it, do it right, take your time, do it right. And you know what? That's how I've been approaching my life. For all these 28 years that I've been a Christian, and I think the Lord has rewarded me in a, in, a, in a sweet, very humbling way to pastor such great people. Great people are around me, man. I can't even tell you how many just great people God just, even the knucklehead great people God sits around. You know, they're, they're great. I'm not talking to you, Mike. I'm just, talk, you know, I'm just, <laughs> just talking about just wonderful people that God sends into my life, and I'm so thankful for that and how humble am I you know how, how, how grateful am I I don't ever want to come across as arrogant I don't ever want to come across as better than you I don't ever want to come across as you're worse and you're bad because let me tell you something if you're covered in the blood if you're covered in the blood you're good but you don't always get good in life if you don't make good decisions after that okay just find security in knowing you're, when you said Jesus be my Lord I know I'm a sinner I know I'm 
defeated. I'm nothing without you, Lord. I, I mean, I need you, Lord. I know I'm wretched. And when you ask him into your heart, man, he says, no man can steal you or snatch you away. Thank you, Lord. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Surely I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down and he will serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch to find them so blessed are those servants, even if it keeps taking longer and longer and longer. Chuck Smith, who I appreciated in his teachings and, and, and getting me going in the Calvary Chapel and the way he just communicated with people um, is, is with the Lord now. And he believed in his day he would see the Lord's return. But know this. Listen to this. This, this. this is different. Know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So if we keep expecting him, we'll push him off a little bit more. He'll come back. Don't worry. There'll be a split second moment. You'll be holding a shake, not expecting him to come back because you just ordered that shake. And he'll come back then, at that moment when you're not expecting him. <laughs> That's what I'm playing. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this par parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. You know, the great thing about a special servant, he also got special treats from the Lord. He just couldn't want more than what the master gave him. That's exactly what Satan wanted. Satan wanted more than what God had given him. And in his mind, he, crossed, he trespassed. He trespassed when he wanted to be like God in his mind. That's a trespass. Got him kicked out of heaven for that. Why steward? Every single one of us is a steward. Every single one of us is a steward to something. And it starts with your own breath, your own life. My daughter is the best steward of her dog that I've met. It rained and so the dogs are playing outside and, and my daughter loves this dog like nobody's business. I walked in there and the dog is sitting there Real comfortable, and she had her paw, and she was just cleaning her every nail, every nail. I mean, she was just getting in there, getting all that mud out, just, just getting it. And uh, I thought, you know, my daughter's being, and you know, my daughter's being a good steward of her dog, taking care of it, because of course she don't want mud in the bed, because if she got mud in the bed, the dog would be outside. But it's not the dog's fault it got mud on him, so my daughter knows that, so it's not the dog's fault she got mud on it, so she cleans it, does her part, is a good steward, so the, dog's, so the dog can sleep in the bed with her and not cry outside. And not only that, God blessed the dog with the dog just lays there. I mean, just, just give every paw. For my daughter being a good steward, my, my dog, because I'm, I'm not that kind of steward, I'm a good steward, I'm not that kind of steward, I grabbed his foot and all that stuff. He wants to bite me, you know what I mean? So I didn't train him like my daughter's been a good steward since the beginning, you know? So we're, we're good stewards even of animals, right? Aren't we stewards of our pets? Yes, we are. And God will hold us accountable to how we treat our pets. I promise you that's in there. Truly, I say to you, no, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion and food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing. And when he comes, when he comes, truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. I think that we are blessed here at Calvary Chapel and that God has trusted the stewardship of, of how we've been doing things. I'm so thankful for the board that watches and helps maintain and manage what we have so that we have boundaries and, you know, we, we kind of, Watch each other and pay attention to those things. It's very important to be a good steward. First Corinthians says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. It's required. It's, it's not a suggestion. You've you got to be a good steward of your kids. You've got to be a good steward of your car. Because that's unrighteous mammon. Your car's unrighteous mammon. You know, it's, it, it is. All, everything of this world is unrighteous because it can't save you. And that's all that means. It can't save you. 
It doesn't have the power to save you. If it doesn't have the power to save you, it's unrighteous. Because only righteousness can save you. Required. As each one has received a gift, and in Matthew chapter 25, I believe, the parable of the talents, we'll get to that eventually, but that's, that's the same concept or the same idea that the Lord is using these parables to come alongside a spiritual truth. That's all a parable is. is it comes alongside a truth that God's trying to help us grasp about responsibility. That's a steward is somebody that has responsibility, and he's telling you. You have responsibility until you die. And then he'll take full responsibility after that. Promise you, he'll take full responsibility. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. We're here to help each other. We're here to lift each other up, to give each other boosts up. We're not just going to run around you as you keep digging another hole and falling in it and getting you out of this hole and you're going to jump in this hole. We're not going to do that. But if you're trying to climb up, I'm going to come right alongside of you and push you here, push you there, push you there, whatever that means from us. Whatever that means. Minister to one another as good stewards. Good stewards. Just be a good steward. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and have an audit. That each one may receive the things done in the body in the unrighteous body, in the unrighteous world, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why, please, hear what we're saying. Hear what the Lord is speaking for yourself. Listen to what he's saying. You're a steward. We're all, we are all well known to God, and I also trust we're all well known in your conscience. Romans 14, so then each of us shall give an account to, of himself to God. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. That's us overseers. That's, that's people that, are, look, every household has a leader and every one of us has responsibility. We just have to be we have to understand that we're going to give an account for everything, for everything. Let them do so with joy and not grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word man speak, man may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For every declaration you make, God's going to call you on that declaration. And a declaration is just, you know, just a, a shout of something like F you or get out of here. You know, just, just something negative, just a, just a shout that you're going to get a count of that. He'll forgive you of it, though. That's the great thing. He, and he'll cover it with his blood because we've all done it. I got a, I got a book f- full of out of words, too. Probably as big as yours but probably not as big as yours. <laughs> Notice I didn't point at nobody. For by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. This is interesting. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Same kind of scenario. Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find him so doing, doing what he was left in charge to do. We as Christians are left in charge of something to do. We're left responsible and in charge of certain things that are our responsibility. Not yours, but yours or mine. But each of us has those. So think about that. The Lord gave you life. And when he gave you life, he made you accountable to that life. Although we might not have understood it, or been trained in it, or been taught it. We were, I was talking this weekend. I met guys that didn't know the Lord. I, I was talking to a man who was 72, retired military, 30 years, got addicted to meth when he was 68. I went, what? <laughs> he goes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mess you up. I go, well, you messed me up, old man. 
two years, he said he was stuck to a pipe. Two years. He said, everybody was wondering, why is this old man starting meth at the 68 years old? He said, I asked myself that at 72 when I was getting off of it. Or 70. And uh, he'd only been saved. He said he knew the Lord, but he'd only been saved since that, when he got arrested. But he, because he was a veteran of 30 years, first time being arrested, he got a sponge through some kind of vet thing. And uh, he was in Mexico serving the Lord, becoming a good servant of what he's got left. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. It don't matter what you got left. Whatever you got, it's all he wants. Whatever, he ha- whatever you have, that's what he wants. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all his anyways. The, the cow, you know, the cows, everything on the hill, everything. He said it's his. Everything is his. It's all his. What are we going to do with his? I'm his. You're his. What are we going to do with that? What are we doing with that? It starts with us, how we treat ourselves, and then how we treat the people next to us because we're steward of relationships. We're stewards, and we're going to be held accountable of all those. But check this one out. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. And surely I say that he will make him ruler over all his goods. And I sense that. I can't even tell you what that feels like. It, it just, it's amazing to have that. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants or take advantage of them, abuse them in any, any way, rob them, embezzle from them. And begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two. Cut him in two. Appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell, man. For being an unjust servant there, it's death and hell. Listen. Today's the day. Today could be the day of, a, of, of, of the audit. The audit could start today. The, the audit could be tonight for you. It could be tomorrow. But the audit is coming. It is absolutely coming. The audit is coming. We as Christians are thankful that the other audit we don't have to worry about. Whew. But don't take this one lightly. I mean, don't just say, well, at least I'm going to heaven. Don't say that. He might create purgatory just for you. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Delay your getting in there. I'm just messing with you. But let me just tell you something. God is, he's, he's, he's not holding back and telling us what our responsibility is. But here's the other deal. That's for Christians, but but for non-Christians, for those of you that have never said yes truly to the Lord Jesus Christ as being your Lord and Savior, man, don't wait until you got a couple of breaths left. But let me tell you something. Even in those couple of breaths, God is gracious. Just like the thief on the cross, God was very gracious to the last few breaths of a dying thief who deserved to die. God was gracious. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. So mix that in with this. Put the, put the harshness of what this sounds like with the gentleness of what we witness on the cross. Try to bring those together and see that God is not bipolar. God is just and holy and it's his way. He created us just like when we come to your house. Whose way is it? When I come to your house, whose house, whose way is it? It's your way. My way. Highway to hell. <laughs> it's my way or the highway to hell, basically. That's a good one. But it's not so good because it's sad. At the end of the day, because the Lord says it's his will that none should perish. You know, that includes Everybody. And whether they're good or bad, he wishes that none should perish. Today's the day of salvation because the day of reckoning is coming. Don't waste this day. Don't waste this opportunity. So 
Why don't everybody stand up with me? Two things today. Two things. Think about your life. Think about the Lord measuring your life to his standards and to what he's, what he's spoken to your heart over the years because everybody's heard his voice. One way or another, we've heard his voice. All of us have. And we know that voice because that we don't like it. <laughs> it's the voice you don't like that tells you to do the things you know you should do but you don't want to do them. That's the voice of the Lord. That's his voice, by the way. It's not yours. It's his Two judgments. So there's, that means there's judgments coming. You're either getting one or the other. But the thing is, since, we're, we, since we know we're going to court, we're not at court yet. And here's, here's, here's what the judge says. The judge says, since it's not court date, all charges against you could be dropped. All charges against you could be dropped. Now, there's two courtrooms... They're going to be dropped one way over here and dropped another way over here. To those of you that don't know the Lord, you're guilty and you're going to die and go to hell. You're guilty and you're going to die in your sin and go to hell. That charge has been put on the books. You're charged with it and the day is coming. Now, he ain't here yet. But if he says that if you come to me and you ask me to take that on myself, I will take the trash and the murder and the filth off of you and put it on myself and free you from all charges. Free you from all charges. All charges. That gives me goosebumps, man, because I want to be free of those charges. But then there's those Christians that he's talking to, those Pharisees that are stewards. And let me tell you something. Every, I guarantee you, 90% of us have a checking account. 90% of us have a checking account. The fact that we have a checking account means we're rich. Now, you may say, uh, <laughs> I almost cussed. Because I knew that's what you would say for me saying you're rich. You cuss me out. That's crazy. But let's compare, let's compare you and your checking account to North Koreans who are eating rocks today. So compared to North Koreans, if I said you're rich, are you rich? Yes, you're rich. Yes, you are. God's not comparing. When he compares us and he throws stuff at us, he's not comparing us with each other. He's comparing us with the whole world. You know what I mean? There's the, there's the, there's the world out there that's different than America. We're the, we're the lukewarm church. We're the church that's too rich to think we need the Lord sometimes. That's us. I'll be honest with you. That's us. But the Lord is trying to change that these days. He gave us 2020 to do that. He gave us 2020 to, to, to shake some things off of us, right? To get us to step back and refocus going forward. That's a beautiful thing. That's a very, very beautiful thing. Now, I'm not saying that the... Way, the way it happened, I don't think he brought it on us, but I think he used it in a very good way. And I think he held it back from being more dangerous than it could have been. I think, I think the intention was to kill more people, and it failed on them because God was a part of it. I guarantee you, they wanted to kill more people, but God wouldn't let, allow it to happen. There I said it. But today, for Christians, God's going to hold you accountable for your bank account, for your unrighteous mammon. And how you use your unrighteous mammon to build righteous kingdom treasure. Because there's a, did I put that in there? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be. You start focusing on heaven, storing up treasure in heaven and put your heart in heaven, God will bless you tremendously. He will blow you away. But if all you care about is the moment, if all you care about is the moment, you're not procuring the right future 
There's a future coming. There's another future coming for all of us. So I'm going to pray. If you feel like you want to, you're, you're, you're standing between the, 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 you're, you're standing in front of the judgment for your sins because Jesus has not been your savior. I want to pray for you this morning. You don't have to come forward because it starts in your heart. It starts with a decision in your heart where you come to yourself and you go, I'm, I'm, this is what I need, and it starts here. But at the same time, you know that you'd also need some prayer. Then you come up to the front and we'll pray for you. And then the others, the rest of you don't need to come up. You're Christians. But here's what you need to understand is God's going to hold you accountable for that unrighteous mammon. I'm just telling you, he's going to hold you accountable for that unrighteous mammon. Use that unrighteous mammon to procure a spiritual future. That's what he's trying to tell us. We can take this stupid, unrighteous stuff and use it for something good. That's why you work. That's why Paul said, look, I, I presented you an opportunity to store up treasures for yourself in heaven. And, it, and he said that after they gave. There's all kind of ways to give. Not to Calvary Chapel, to give your life. To give your service. To give your heart to your neighbors, to your friends, to your community, wherever you're at. Your jobs, wherever. You, 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 you all have that power. We all have that power to, to be that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for those who have never made you Lord and Savior. And right now, Lord God, I know their hearts are stirred and I know that they sense, Lord God, where they failed in their stewardship of who they are and what they've done. And Lord, we just ask you that you would just draw them to yourself this morning. Lovingly, Lord, embrace them and show them that you love them in spite of their sins, in spite of their ugliness, in spite of the, the debaucheries of their, what's in their souls and their spirits, Lord God. Do you want to wash that away just like you did mine? Washed my sins away, Lord. Washed my past away. Gave me the hope for a new future, Lord God. And it blessed me beyond my wildest imagination. If that's you this morning, all you have to do is say, Lord, have mercy on me. Just, Lord, have mercy on me. Show me truth, Lord. Guide me to true paths, Lord God. Let me know the true way of living, the true way of, of, of finding you, Lord. And Father, I just pray for those that need prayer this morning. Lord, that you give them the courage to come forward and ask for prayer. To humble themselves and recognize that they're powerless and need assistance and need help, Lord. And that's what we're here for. And Father, I pray for the rest of us that we learn to, learn to manage our unrighteous mammon. Learn to use our unrighteous mammon, Lord God, for a, for a true future, for a wonderful future, for treasures in heaven, Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things shall be added to us. And Lord, I pray that we grab the reality to trust in giving beyond our, our, our normal way of giving. Giving in a way that's uncomfortable for us, Lord. Whether it's our lives, whether it's our service, whether it's our finances, whatever it is, Lord. As Christians, teach us to use what we have to invest in a future, Lord God. Because how can you trust us up there if you can't trust us down here? And Lord, I just thank you for this wonderful day. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Get to the restaurants. You'll be early. You'll meet everybody else.